The Face of War by Martha Gailhorn The War in Spain In the summer of 1936, I was checking background material for a novel in the Weltkrieg's Bibliothek of Stuttgart. The Nazi newspapers began to speak of fighting in Spain. They did not talk of war. The impression I got was of a bloodthirsty rebel attacking the forces of decency and order. The Spanish rebel, which was the duly elected Republic of Spain, was always referred to as the Red Swine Dogs. The Nazi papers had one solid value. Whatever they were against, you could be for. Shortly after I was twenty-one, I had gone to France to work, and there became one of a group of young French pacifists. We had in common our poverty and our passion. Our aim in life was to kick out the evil old, who were clearly leading us into another war. We believed that there could be no peace in Europe without Franco-German rapprochement. We had the right idea, but the Nazis arrived. In 1934 we met the young Nazis in Berlin. At the frontier, German police had come through the train, paused in our third-class carriage, and confiscated our newspapers. Although we represented no one except ourselves, we read and disagreed on all opinions, ranging from monarchist to socialist to liberal reformer, me. We're united for once in thinking this newspaper seizure an outrage. When we got off the train, in our usual shabby argumentative huddle, we were greeted by the young Nazis in clean, blonde, khaki-clad formation. They proved to have one parrot brain among the lot, and we did not care for them. We tried very hard to excuse them. We tried to agree that they were socialist, and they kept assuring us not national socialists. Being sorry for the defeated Germans was a condition of mind of many people after both world wars. I had it then. Also, I was a pacifist, and it interfered with my principles to use my eyes. By 1936, no amount of clinging to principles helped me. I saw what these bullying Nazi louts were like and were up to. But there I was, working with miserable determination on a novel about young pacifists in France. I stayed some months in Germany discussing with anyone who still dared to discuss the freedom of the mind, the rights of the individual, and the red swine dogs of Spain. Then I went back to America, finished my novel, shoved it forever into a desk drawer, and started to get myself to Spain. I'd stopped being a pacifist and become an anti-fascist. By the winter of 1937, the Western democracies had proclaimed the doctrine of non-intervention, which meant simply that neither people nor supplies could pass freely to the Republican territory of Spain. I went to the French authorities in Paris to get whatever stamps or papers were required to leave the country. The French functionnaire, as all know who have dealt with him, is a certified brute. He sits and listening behind a grill, scratching away with a sharp governmental pen and pallid ink. I cannot have come out well with this type, as I only remember studying a map, taking a train, getting off at a station nearest to Andorran Spanish border, walking a short distance from one country to another, and taking a second train, ancient cold little carriages full of the soldiers of the Spanish Republic who were returning to Barcelona on leave. They hardly looked like soldiers, being dressed however they were able, and obviously this was an army in which you fed yourself since the government could not attend to that. I was in a wooden carriage with six boys who were eating garlic sausage and bread made of powdered stone. They offered me their food, they laughed, they sang. Whenever the train stopped, another young man, perhaps their officer, stuck his head in the carriage and exhorted them. I gathered that he was exhorting them to behave beautifully. They did behave beautifully, but I do not know what they said, as I spoke no Spanish. Barcelona was bright with sun and gay with red banners, and the taxi driver refused money. Apparently everything was free. Apparently everyone was everyone else's brother, too. Since new people have lived in such an atmosphere, even for a minute, I can report that it is the loveliest atmosphere going. I was handed around like a package, with jollity and kindness. I rode on trucks and in jammed cars. And finally, by way of Valencia, we came at night to Madrid, which was cold, 
enormous and pitch black, and the streets were silent and perilous with shell holes. That was on March 27th, 1937, a date I have found somewhere in notes. I had not felt as if I were at a war until now, but now I knew I was. It was a feeling I cannot describe. A whole city was a battlefield, waiting in the dark. There was certainly fear in that feeling, and courage. It made you walk carefully and listen hard, and it lifted the heart. In New York a friendly and spirited man, then an editor of Collier's, had given me a letter. The letter said, to whom it might concern, that the bearer, Martha Gailhorn, was a special correspondent for Collier's in Spain. This letter was intended to help me with any authorities who wondered what I was doing in Spain, or why I was trying to get there. Otherwise it meant nothing. I had no connection with a newspaper or magazine, and I believed that all one did about a war was to go to it, as a gesture of solidarity, and get killed, or survive if lucky, until the war was over. That was what happened in the trenches of France, as I had read. Everyone was dead or wounded badly enough to be sent away. I had no idea you could be what I became, an unscathed tourist of wars. A knapsack and approximately fifty dollars were my equipment for Spain. Anything more seemed unnecessary. I tagged along behind the war correspondents, experienced man who had serious work to do. Since the authorities gave them transport and military passes, transport was the far harder to come by than permission to see everything. It was an open, intimate war. I went with them to the fronts in and around Madrid. Still, I did nothing except learn a little Spanish and a little about war, and visit the wounded, trying to amuse or distract them. It was a poor effort, and one day, weeks after I had come to Madrid, a journalist friend observed that I ought to write. It was the only way I could serve the causa, as the Spaniards solemnly and we lovingly called the war in the Spanish Republic. After all, I was a writer, was I not? And how could I write about war, and what did I know, and for whom would I write? What made a story to begin with? Didn't something gigantic and conclusive have to happen before one could write an article? My journalist friend suggested that I write about Madrid. Why would that interest anyone, I asked. It was daily life. He pointed out that it was not everybody's daily life. I mailed my first Madrid article to Collier's, not expecting them to publish it. But I did have that letter, so I knew Collier's address. Collier's accepted the piece, and after my next article put my name on the masthead. I learned this by accident. Once on the masthead, I was evidently a war correspondent. It began like that. This is the place to express my gratitude to a vanished magazine, and to Charles Colbo, the editor who then ran it. Thanks to Collier's, I had the chance to see the life of my time which was war. They never cut or altered anything I wrote. They did, however, invent their own titles for most of my articles. I did not like their titles, and I am not using them here, but they were a trifling price to pay for the freedom colliers gave me. For eight years I could go where I wanted, when I wanted, and write what I saw. What was new and prophetic about the war in Spain was the life of the civilians who stayed at home and had war brought to them, I have selected three reports on this 20th century war in the city. The people of the Republic of Spain were the first to suffer the relentless totality of modern war. I have praised the cows of the Republic of Spain on the slightest provocation for 20 years, and I am tired of explaining that the Spanish Republic was neither a collection of blood-slathering reds nor a cat's paw of Russia. Long ago I also gave up repeating that the men who fought and those who died for the Republic, whatever the nationality, and whether they were communists, anarchists, socialists, poets, plumbers, middle-class professional men, or the one Abyssinian prince, were brave and disinterested, and there were no rewards in Spain. They were fighting for us all against the combined force of European fascism. They deserved our thanks and our respect and got neither. I felt then, and still do, that the Western democracies had two commanding obligations. They must save their honor by assisting a young, attacked fellow democracy, 
and they must save their skin by fighting Hitler and Mussolini at once in Spain, instead of waiting until later, when the cost in human suffering would be unimaginably greater. Arguments were useless during the Spanish War, and ever after. The carefully fostered prejudice against the Republic of Spain remains impervious to time and facts. All of us who believed in the causa of the Republic will mourn the Republic's defeat and the death of its defenders forever, and will continue to love the land of Spain and the beautiful people who are among the noblest and unluckiest on earth. London, 1959 High Explosive for Everyone July 1937 At first the shells went over. You could hear the thud as they left the fascist's gun, a sort of groaning cough. Then you heard them fluttering toward you. As they came closer, the sound went faster and straighter and sharper, and then very fast you heard the great booming noise when they hit. But now, for I don't know how long, because time didn't mean much, they had been hitting on the street in front of the hotel, and on the corner, and to the left in the side street. When the shells hit that close, it was a different sound. The shells whistled toward you. It was as if they whirled at you, faster than you could imagine speed, and spinning that way, they whined. The whine rose higher and quicker and was a close scream, and then they hit, and it was like granite thunder. There wasn't anything to do, or anywhere to go. You could only wait. But waiting alone in a room that got duster and duster as the powdered cobblestones of the street floated into it was pretty bad. I went downstairs into the lobby, practicing on the way how to breathe. You couldn't help breathing strangely, just taking the air into your throat and not being able to inhale it. It seemed a little crazy to be living in a hotel like a hotel in Des Moines or New Orleans, with a lobby and quicker chairs in the lounge, and signs on the door of your room telling you that they would press your clothes immediately, and that meals served privately cost ten percent more, and meantime it was like a trench when they lay down an artillery barrage. The whole place trembled to the explosion of the shells. The concierge was in the lobby, and he said, apologetically, "'I regret this, mademoiselle. It is not pleasant.' I can guarantee you that the bombing in November was worse. However, it is regrettable. I said yes, indeed. It was not very nice, was it? He said that perhaps I had better take a room in the back of the house, which might be safer. On the other hand, the rooms were not so agreeable. There was less air. I said of course there wouldn't be so much air. Then we stood in the lobby and listened. You could only wait. All over Madrid for fifteen days now, people had been waiting. You waited for the shelling to start, and for it to end, and for it to start again. It came from three directions, at any time, without warning and without purpose. Looking out the door, I saw people standing in doorways all around the square, just standing there patiently, and then suddenly a shell landed, and there was a fountain of granite cobblestones flying up into the air, and the silver lit it smoke floated off softly. A little Spaniard with a lavender shirt, a ready-made bow-tie and bright brown eyes was standing in the door watching this with interest. There was also no reason for the shells to stay out of the hotel. They could land inside that door as well as anywhere else. Another shell hit, halfway across the street, and a window broke gently and airily, making a lovely, tickling musical sound. I was watching the people in the other doorways as best I could, watching those immensely quiet, stretched faces. You had a feeling you had been waiting here forever, and yesterday you felt the same way. The little Spaniard said to me, You don't like it? No. Nothing, he said. It is nothing. It will pass. In any case, you can only die once. Yes, I said but without enthusiasm. We stood there a moment, and there was silence. Before this, the shells had been falling one a minute. Well, he said, I think that is all. I have work to do. I am a serious man. I cannot spend my time waiting for shells. Salud, he said, and walked out calmly into the street, 
and calmly crossed it. Seeing him, some other men decided the shelling was finished, too, and presently people were crossing that square, which now was poke-marked with great round holes and littered with broken cobblestones and glass. An old woman with a market basket on her arm hurried down a side street, and two boys came around the corner, arm in arm, singing. I went back to my room, and again suddenly there came that whistle, wine, scream, roar, and the noise was in your throat, and you couldn't feel or hear or think, and the building shook and seemed to settle. Outside in the hall, the maids were calling to one another, like birds, in high excited voices. The concierge ran upstairs, looking concerned and shaking his head. On the floor above, we went into a room in which the lidded smoke still hung mistily. There was nothing left in that room. The furniture was kindling wood. The walls were stripped and in places torn open. A great hole led into the next room, and the bed was twisted iron and stood upright and silly against the wall. "'Oh, my!' the concierge said miserably. "'Look, Conchita!' one of the maids said to the other. "'Look at the hole there. Is in 219 too?' Oh, one of the youngest maids said, Imagine, it has also spoiled the bathroom in 218. The journalist who lived in that room had left for London the day before. Well, the concierge said, There is nothing to do. It is very regrettable. The maids went back to work. An aviator came down from the fifth floor. He said it was disgusting. He had two days' leave and this sort of thing went on. Moreover, he said, a shell fragment had hit his room and broken all his toilet articles. It was inconsiderate. It wasn't right. He would now go out and have a beer. He waited at the door for a shell to land and ran across the square, reaching the café across the street just before the next shell. He couldn't wait forever. He couldn't be careful all day. Later... You could see people around Madrid examining the new shell holes with curiosity and wonder. Otherwise they went on with the routine of their lives, as if they had been interrupted by a heavy rainstorm but nothing more. In a café, which was hit in the morning, where three men were killed sitting at a table reading their morning papers and drinking coffee, the clients came back in the afternoon. You went to Chicote's bar at the end of the day, walking up the street which was no man's land where you could hear the shells whistling even when there was silence and the bar was crowded as always. On the way you had passed a dead horse and a very dead mule, chopped with shell fragments, and you had passed criss-crossing trails of human blood on the pavement. You would be walking down a street, hearing only the city noises of street cars and automobiles and people calling to one another, and suddenly crushing it all out would be the huge stony deep booming of a falling shell at the corner. There was no place to run, because how did you know that the next shell would not be behind you, or ahead, or to the left or right? And going indoors was fairly silly too, considering what shells can do to a house. So perhaps you went into a store because that was what you had intended doing before all this started. Inside a shoe shop five women are trying on shoes. The girls are buying summery sandals, sitting by the front window of the shop. After the third explosion, the salesman says politely, I think we had better move farther back into the shop. The window might break and cut you. Women are standing in line, as they do all over Madrid. Quiet women, dressed usually in black, with market baskets on their arms waiting to buy food. A shell falls across the square. They turn their heads to look and move a little closer to the house, but no one leaves her place in line. After all, they have been waiting there for three hours and the children expect food at home. In the Plaza Mayor, the shoe blacks stand around the edges of the square with their little boxes of creams and brushes, and passers-by stop and have their shoes polished as they read a paper or gossip together. When the shells fall too heavily... The shoe blacks pick up their boxes and retreat a little way into a side street. So now the square is empty, though people are leaning close against the houses around it, and the shells are falling so fast that there is almost no time between them to hear them coming, 
only the steady roaring as they land on the granite cobblestones. Then for a moment it stops, an old woman with a shawl over her shoulders, holding a terrified thin little boy by the hand, runs out into the square. You know what she's thinking. She is thinking she must get the child home. You are always safer in your own place, with the things you know. Somehow you do not believe you can get killed when you are sitting in your own parlor. You never think that. She is in the middle of the square when the next one comes. A small piece of twisted steel, hot and very sharp, sprays off from the shell. It takes the little boy in the throat. The old woman stands there, holding the hand of the dead child, looking at him stupidly, not saying anything. And men run out toward her to carry the child. At their left, on the side of the square, is a huge brilliant sign which says, Get out of Madrid. No one lived here any more because there was nothing left to live in, and besides, the trenches were only two blocks away, and there was another front in the Casa de Campo down to the left. Stray bullets droned over the streets, and a stray is just as dangerous as any other kind of bullet if it hits you. You walked past the street barricades, past the ruined houses, and the only sound you heard was a machine gun hammering in University City, and a bird. It was a little like walking in the country over gutted country roads, and the street barricades made it all seem very strange, and the houses were like scenery in a war movie. It seemed impossible that houses could really be like that. We were going to visit a janitor who lived in this section, he and his family. They were the only people here except the soldiers who guarded the barricades. His name was Pedro. Pedro lived in a fine apartment house. He had been the janitor and caretaker for eight years. In November a bomb fell on the roof. Pedro and his family had been in their tiny basement apartment when the bomb hit, and they were all safe. They saw no reason to move. They were used to living there, and in time of war a basement is more desirable than in time of peace. They showed us their building with pride. They went into a marble hall, past an elevator, through a mahogany front door, and were in a room that was all dust and broken plaster. Looking up for eight stories, you could see the insides of all the apartments in that building. The bomb had fallen squarely, and now only the outside walls remained. There was a very fine bathroom on the seventh floor, and the tube was hanging into space by its pipes. A cabinet with china in it stood on the fourth floor, and all the china was in neat, unbroken piles. The concierge's two little daughters played in this destruction as children play in an empty lot or in caves they have found beside a river. We sat in their underground apartment, with the lights burning, and talked. They said yes, of course, it was difficult to get food, but then it was difficult for everyone, and they had never really been hungry. Yes, the bombing had been very bad, but they had just waited in the basement and finally it had stopped. The only trouble, they said, was that the children couldn't go to school because the school had been bombed, and it was impossible to let the children go all the way across Madrid to another school, because bullets wind up past the street barricades at the end of their block, and they couldn't risk having the children hurt. Juanita remarked that she didn't like school anyhow very much. She wanted to be an artist, and it was better to sit at home and paint. She had been copying a picture, with crayons and wrapping paper of a very elegant Spanish gentleman whose portrait hung on the wall of a ruined first-floor apartment in their building. Mrs. Pedro said it was wonderful now. Women could have careers in Spain. Did I know about that? That was since the Republic. We are very in favor of the Republic, she said. I think Maria may be able to get training as a doctor. Isn't it fine? Can women be doctors in North America? I always got a shock from the Palace Hotel, because it had a concierge's desk and a sign saying Coiffeur on the first floor, and another sign saying how beautiful Mallorca was, and they had an hotel to recommend there. The Palace Hotel had its old furniture, but it smelled of ether and was crowded with bandaged men. It is the first military hospital of Madrid now. I went around to the operation room, which used to be the reading room. There were bloody stretchers piled in the hall, 
but it was quiet this afternoon. The Empire bookcases, where they used to keep dull reading for the hotel guests, were now used for bandages and hypodermic needles and surgical instruments, and there were brilliant lights in the cut-glass chandeliers to make operating easier. The nurse on duty told me about the man on the sixth floor, and I went up to see them. The room was full of sun. There were four men. One of them was sitting with his leg up on a chair. It was in plaster. He had on a red blouse and was sitting in profile. Beside him, a man with a beret was working quietly, drawing his portrait in pastels. The two other men were in bed. One of them I tried not to look at. The other one was quiet and pale and looked tired. Once or twice he smiled, but did not speak. He had a bad chest wound. The man in the red blouse was a Hungarian. His knee had been smashed by a piece of shell. He was handsome and very polite, and refused politely to talk about his wound because it was of no importance. He was alive. He was very lucky. The doctors were fine, and his knee would probably get well. At any rate, he would be able to limp. He wanted to talk about his friend who was making his portrait. Jamie, he said, is a fine artist. Look how well he works. He always wanted to be an artist, but he never had so much time before. Jamie smiled and went on. He was working very close to the paper, stopping now and again and peering at the man in the red blouse. His eyes looked a little strange, filmed over and dim. I said it was a fine portrait, a great likeness, and he thanked me. A little later someone called him, and he left, and then the man in the red blouse said he was wounded in the head. He covers it with a beret. His eyes are not very good. They are very bad, really. He does not see much. We ask him to paint pictures of us, to keep him busy and make him think he still sees well. Jimmy never complains about it. I said softly, What happened to that boy over there? He's an aviator. He was blonde and young, with a round face. There was nothing left except the eyes. He had been shot down in his plane and burned, but he had been wearing goggles, and that saved his sight. His face and hands were a hard brown thick scab, and his hands were enormous. There were no lips, only the scab. The worst was that his pain was so great he couldn't sleep. Then a soldier I knew, a Pole, came in and said, Listen, Dominican room 507 has some mimosa, a whole big branch of it. Do you want to come up and see it? He says it grows all around where he lives in Marseille. I never saw any flowers like that before. Every once in a while the actors would stop talking and wait. Shells were exploding down the street in the Plaza Mayor and to the right of the Gran Via, and when they hit too close you couldn't hear the lines of the play, so they waited. It was a benefit performance on Sunday morning. It was to make money for the hospitals. An amateur had written the play, and amateurs directed, costumed, and acted it. It couldn't have been more amateur. The audience was delighted. It was a dramatic play, all about the moral and psychological crisis of a young man who decided not to enter the priesthood. The audience thought it was terribly funny and laughed with great good will at the emotional places. The hero came out, after the curtain rang down, and said he was sorry he'd forgotten his lines that way, but he hadn't had time to memorize them. He'd been in the trenches near Garabitas until just a few hours ago. Everyone knew an attack had been going on there for two days, and so he couldn't memorize things. The audience applauded and shouted that it was quite all right. They didn't care anyhow. Then he said he had written a poem up there in the trenches, and he would like to recite it. He did. It rolled and tossed and was full of enormous big words and remarkable rhymes and his gestures were excellent and when he was through the audience cheered him and he looked very happy. He was a nice boy, if not a brilliant poet, and they knew he had been in a bad piece of trench and they liked plays and theatres, even bad plays and even theatres just down the street from where the shells were landing. Every night, lying in bed, you can hear the machine guns in University City, 
just ten blocks away. Every once in a while you can hear the dull, heavy explosion of a trench mortar. When the shells wake you, you think first that it is thunder. If they are not too close, you do not really wake. You know that in November there were black junker planes flying over and dropping bombs, that all winter long there was no fuel, and the days were cold and the nights were colder. You know that food is scarce, and that all these people have sons and husbands and sweethearts at the front somewhere. And now they are living in a city where you take your chances and hope your chances are good. You have seen no panic, no hysteria. You have heard no hate talk. You know they have the kind of faith which makes courage and the fine future. You have no right to be disturbed. There are no lights anywhere, and the city itself is quiet. The sensible thing is to go back to sleep.'